out from our daddy. This is the big one, big game. This is the sequel to Nemesis and Wanted with art by superstar Pepe Larraz. Variant covers are by Frank Whiteley, Jay Lee, JG Jones and Danny Earls. Do not miss. <laughs> I, I cannot hear you. I don't. We're good. Is that us? Okay, where are you? Perfect. Can you see me? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where are you? Are you still in Scotland or you moved? I am. Like, I'm in my holiday home in Scotland. We're up here for summer just seeing family and everything, you know? Okay. And that's why I screwed everything up. Just to explain to everybody <laughs> that basically we've done this already. And this is why... This is going to be a tiny version of the brilliant one we did yesterday. You yeah, know? But it will be like a myth, you know, something that happened and nobody knew but us. And we, we will make it bigger every time we talk about it. It's like, <laughs> you remember, you, we talk about it. It was, it was glorious. <laughs> I want people yeah. to claim they've seen it. You know, it's like people yeah. think they were there, but they weren't. It was just you and I. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, people start lying like, no, no, I yeah. saw it. I saw it. The best I in, in the internet. Yeah. You were so wise. Uh, I don't think you can be that wise two days in a row. I don't think we can pull this off. You know? No, no, no. I, cannot, I cannot be wise twice in a week. I can only be wise once in a week. <laughs> <laughs> no, this, like, nice. You know, the really terrible TV movie version of the one we did yesterday, you know, yeah. because we, you can never get the, the passion back, you know? Yeah. So, so, I mean, what happened was, just to explain to people, like I say, I'm in my holiday place. Um, I was using my niece's boyfriend's computer and <laughs> it didn't save it didn't save the interview. Whereas I'm on my wife's computer again, so like hopefully everything's cool, you know. But we it were covering, we were we, we were pimping big game, weren't we? I mean, we were we gave it the most amazing hard sell of how good this comic is gonna be yeah. and why everybody should buy it. I mean, it's better than everything else out there, isn't it? It's so good. No, it's uh, today I received my my comps, my yeah. my copies of the book. And it was, I was looking at it and it was like, oh man, it's so good. Look, I have one here. Oh man, I haven't seen it. Because I'm in Scotland, I haven't seen that. Oh, that looks nice, doesn't it? Oh, you haven't seen it? No, no, no. I've, I've been away for a couple of weeks. It's I'm very good. I'm not going to reveal anything. Amazing. I love it. The coloring is really good too, actually, isn't it? It's nice. What's the back cover? Mm -hmm. The back cover of the Nemesis ad, yeah, for the trade? The back no, cover? I think it's, my, it's my own. I have double oh, cover. Oh wow, that's amazing! Amazing. And the back cover is my that? last page. Yeah, is the last page. Yeah, I'm not going to show anything to you guys in the internet. Aha, buy the book. You have to pay five bucks. You know the cool thing. It's gonna be out exactly when I'm in San Diego, so I hope to sign a lot of those. Great, great. Yeah, I'm gonna be in San Diego. And there's a San Diego oh, convention yeah, exclusive great. as well. Yeah. Did you know that there's a convention exclusive? Oh, yeah. In San Diego, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There is like a lot of covers, maybe like six, seven, seven of them. Like a lot of covers. I think we've got the Jay Lee cover with Kick Ass and Hit Girl, which is great. So have you seen it? It's so yeah. good, isn't it? So good. No, no, Frank, I have I have them all. Yeah. Frank Quietly's cover uh, from Jupiter's Legacy. We've got JG Jones mm. doing Wanted. JG Jones doing Wanted, the character from Wanted. Yeah. Uh, and a guy called Danny Errol. Yeah, the, the what? He did a great nemesis cover, mm -hmm. so the, and and obviously you're on. Who's this guy? I, I, I didn't know him. I, I, he was under my radar. Uh, this guy, Danny, but it's so good. I I'm always online, right, looking at artists. Like in my tea break, I always pick up a, a you know a cup of tea and I sit and look at comic book art, you know. And I saw this guy. He did a picture of Batman, and it was kind of a homage to the 1990s Batman animated series, but he'd done it in this very realistic style. It looked kind of like Dave Johnson, the kind of structure of it all. And I was like, this guy's great. And yeah. I, just called, I just called him cold and said, do you want to do a cup? And he was delighted, you know? So mm -hmm. so he's not well-known yet, but he's going to become well-known. He's an Irish artist. He's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I like the way the frames, the, um, you know, the character is very tiny and yeah. you have this big shot of the city. So it yeah. gives a lot of ambience. I love that. I, that's what I tried to do in the in our comic as well. Listen, you know? I mean, all the praise I gave you yesterday is going to sound yeah. so insincere now if I say it again, right? But you know how much I love, <laughs> I love your stuff. Right, just insincere. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm you know, I'm not going to believe you again. I mean, I didn't believe you yesterday. I'm not going to believe you today. 
But I told you every time you sent a page, I would send you like a love letter, wasn't it? Like, a, And I would tell you why the page was so good. I was like, what your choice for panel two was such a bold choice. You know, I'd, I'd really go into detail and everything. You know, you know it's, 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 it's weird. I mean, when I, when I, now big game is in that place where I like it. Yeah. But uh, I mean, a year has passed from the first issue, so I don't hate it right now. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's in the valley. <laughs> you know? And I can look at it and say, okay, I like it. I like, I like the way it looks. No, I'm, I'm very proud of the book. I have problems with my own books when I when when I read them because I I only see the 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 failures. It's like okay, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, and this doesn't. And that's why I don't read read my own books. Yeah, and like five years has, has passed or something like that. But, but uh, do you not think that's a sign of a good a good creative person though? Because if you're happy with your work, you never strive to be better. Hmm. So Self criticism. As long as it doesn't go too crazy, self criticism, hand in hand with appreciation for yourself, is healthy. You need the balance, I think, because some of the worst artists I know think they're amazing. They'll be like, "Look at this amazing new page I've done." You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more like like a balance between that. Is like yeah. I would love to have this kind of, uh, um, how can I say? It's like in in Spanish, it's aplomo. It's like self assurance or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I have a friend uh, works for the French market. And once I asked him, like, who is your favorite artist? And he said, it's me. <laughs> like, okay. I I love mean, that. You have to pull up yourself. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it, it's a good reason. It was a great reason. It was like, I'm going to spend a lot of time with my art. So yeah. I like it. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> you know, I love that. Yeah. Matthew McConaughey has an interesting answer. People say, you know, who's your, your hero? And he said, my hero is me in two years time because he, he visualizes that guy he's going to be in two years and he, he wants to be him so badly, which is quite a nice way to live your life too, isn't it? I think that yeah. as a creative, yeah. I, I have a, a good answer because I'm very shy. So when people come to me and say like, hey, I love your art and I love what you do, I never know what face to make. So I figure out a, a good answer. Like you have to you have to make a good answer. Yeah. And it's, what I say is, thank you. I hope so, because it pays my flat. <laughs> it's like, I love your art. It's like, thank you. It pays my flat. I, I, I hope <laughs> yeah, I hope to be doing it well. But some people take criticism, uh, not criticism, they take praise really badly. Like I remember saying to Howard Chaikin once, Chaikin, you're like a genius. And he looked at me like I was an idiot. And he was just kind of yeah. like, well, you know, and I don't, I don't know if I heard that maybe it's a self defense thing, or he doesn't realize how brilliant he is. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think, I think he must know. I mean, he's Howard Chaikin. I mean, he's yeah. a big name in the industry. I think he gave some kind of, um, like an internship in Marvel or something. Yes. He was giving lessons to to the new artist. I miss that. I mean, my friend Mahmoud Ashrar was there, and I miss that. Yeah, it was like, oh man, isn't it weird that comics and comic art in particular? Is a thing that you don't get a mentorship, you know, because if you're if you're in surgery and you want to be an orthopedic surgeon, you spend mm -hmm. a couple of years with orthopedic surgeons, you know, who who are masters and teach you, you know. And it's it's so odd that comics you just have to find your own way, really, don't you? If you're an artist, you I mean you have the best university in the world, which is the yeah. great artists who came before you and you look at their work. But it would be nice sometimes, wouldn't it, to have somebody who really knows what they're they're doing, going through the pages with you and talking to you about choices, like Jacob, who's a master. Yeah. And and it's it's nice because when you are talking with artists, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, when I when I make panels or they ask me to do a, like a master class in a school of comics, mm -hmm. the talk you give is completely different from the talk you will give to the public to the readers. I mean, it's not the same public as it's a different kind of talk i can search on the internet for interviews of artists i like or writers i like but it's going to be always you know talking to the readers never talking to the colleagues yeah. uh, i remember i gave one yeah. panel in a school of comics here in madrid mm -hmm. and it was a one panel about failure mm -hmm. <laughs> i wanted to talk about failure yeah. about how to digest the failure when you you try to do something and you fail yeah and how to digest that and it was very interesting because it was something that they should know about. It's like, okay, you need to face this and, and you're going to, I don't know. And rejection? I mean, did you did you ever face any kind of rejection? Because I felt as if 
you came from nowhere and you were suddenly huge. You know, like I know you came in with for me it was Ultimate Spider Man you came in with because you mm. fit that book very well. You and Sarah Pacelli, you and um, Stuart Eminen, you know, there was a, a shared DNA in your style. So, but but you were starting big. I mean, that was a big book you came in on at a very popular time. Um, but I know you did Thor for a little while with Matt Fraction as well, didn't you? you know, so yeah. you're on very high profile books. I don't. Most people start off doing, you know, a backup strip, you know, somewhere that like nobody sees. But you seem to be in the limelight right away. How, how did that? Well, I did that too. I mean, my start it was nothing special. I mean. Yeah. I the only the only thing special about my starting in in Marvel mm -hmm. was that I that I sent uh, one email every week, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I used to say that they they hired me because it was like more easy to me for them to pay me to stop emailing them. <laughs> it's like okay, yeah, pay this guy. <laughs> so yeah, they hired me and and I started to make like one issue of Web of Spider Man and one issue of that and one issue of those. And it was because Pascual Ferri was doing Thor as a very good friend of mine. Yeah. And he recommended me like, okay, if I fail, use this guy. And Pascual is like a high profile guy. So, so he put me kind of put me there. So yeah. Then they gave me the series. So, I mean, I was up to the task, but uh, the point of getting there, it was absolutely Pascual. Yeah, it was. I, I didn't know that. And I, I'm a huge fan of Pascual. You know, I, I, I met in 20, I was in Barcelona in 2004 uh, with Mako and those guys, you know, and, and I uh, I met Pascal and Salvador La Roca, um, mm -hmm. who are both fantastic. And I just really fell in love with the style. He's got such a lovely, fluid style. And I can see its similarities to yours. It's very European and there's no hard mm -hmm. edges and everything. It's just beautiful, easy on the eye. It's, it's what I told you yesterday. It's about, they, they told me, follow Pascual. And they they made me test. Marvel made me some tests. Like, okay, can you mimic Pasquale's style? Oh, and really? yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I did it. So, yeah, kind of they pay me to yeah. learn. Right. That's cool. <laughs> it was it was fantastic because it was like my internship because I was paid to yeah. to do pages. But at the same time, I was studying my friend, so I was studying the style. Not only you know the face of the style, the the surface, but the the way he framed the scene. When he uses the um, the the you know the close up and he uses the panoramics and yeah. the way he make the panoramics, I was studying all that. Yeah. So they were they were paying me for learning. It was fantastic. Did you ever yeah. see the Adam Strange book he did about twenty years ago with uh, Andy Diggle? So mm. great. six part series, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, his style is between the the French market and the American market, and is nowhere near those those markets. It's completely yeah. different of everything else. And it's fantastic. I mean, he the, the fluidity of the pencil and, and the anatomy he has is, I mean, it's, it's from other world. Is that so, genius? I think you have this too, which is, it looks like you're doing it quickly, even though you're not. It looks like you're having a good time and you you haven't had to think about it because it comes so naturally. I think you guys have that, that, that look. And I know that you will agonize over it. You'll think about it all the time. But it's yeah. got it doesn't have the stiffness that sometimes comes with that. It's got, it's still kept its energy and its, its fluidity, I think. I don't know. The other day I was uh, messing around in Twitter and I say like, okay, this is my golden rule. If the page has more than four panels, yeah. one is going to be a silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> my golden rule. And then Matias Vergara, you know, the guy, the guy. I love Matthias. Matthias Vergara. He's amazing. So good. Yes. One of the best thinkers in the business as well. I love his stuff. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. I mean, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of him. Yeah. He answered my, my tweet. And say like, okay, my golden rule is I make one good panel, yeah, and the rest is okay. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, like, one very good panel, and the rest is like okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was it made me think about it because I think I do more or less the same. I call it the poster page. Yeah, I mean, I just I usually when I not don't know exactly what to do, I base the page in a very big picture. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it is the narrative panels, but the the big one is like the the aria in the opera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I I used to say that the, um, we have like aria pages, mm -hmm. and you have like um, you know in the opera when they are just talking, but they look like they're singing, like, bruh, 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 but they are talking, so the story can go forward. Yeah, we have some pages that is like that, is exposition pages, but the 
the pages that people remember is like the aria pages with the big panels i think that's an important thing for artists especially young artists to understand as well not every panel should be a poster shot yep. you know like neil adams did the same thing where he would pick one panel in every page and that was his panel yep. that everyone would remember but you are still telling a story so if everything is turned up to 11 on every panel you you almost don't notice the art it's too much isn't it your, your brain can't process it that's something that scares me a lot i mean there are some people in the industry that draw beautifully yeah but but some reason at, at some point in in the book i get like fed up yeah it's like I, mean, I get saturated and 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 that scares me a lot because i i, I feel that at some point yeah. I, I can fall in that in that well you know it's like I don't know, uh, because I, when you are drawing, it's like, okay, I'm going to give more and more. Yeah, I'm going to make this great page because every page is a battle and you want to win them all. And it's, it takes a lot of, um, how you how you can say, like, it takes a lot of uh, intelligence to know that uh, some pages you are, you are going to lose. It's like, they, they, don't, they don't have to look good. They yeah. just have to tell the story well and keep the energy for the next one. So if you modulate that energy, you're gonna have later, you you can have more impact mm -hmm. than if every panel is super impactful and every every page is like, boom, you know? You don't think sometimes though, that especially background stuff is drawn in out of insecurity. So mm -hmm. people think I need to make this really cool, you know, and, and they fill up with things because they never made the right choice with the first line. Yeah. So Ooh. I see that all the time, especially young guys starting out. And you know the artist, the classical artist, Medigliani? Like Medigliani would, would you know, uh, he had a very minimalist style of drawing, you know? And that's what interests me in comic book art. Somebody like Alex Toth or, or um, Goran Parlov. Like yeah. Goran Parlov knows exactly where to put the pen. And he doesn't need to draw a million things behind it because what he drew is absolutely necessary. And that's all you need, isn't it? It's perfect. So sometimes it's insecurity, isn't it, to fill, fill in the background? Yeah. It's, it's nice you mentioned that because some friends of mine here in Spain, they call it to do a la raz, to What's make that? a la raz. <laughs> <laughs> because of me. It's like to feel everything. <laughs> <laughs> when you're so insecure that you need to feel everything, this is to do a la raz for them. They call it that. <laughs> so I guess, I guess I'm, I'm doing that. <laughs> I, don't, I think you make the good choices, though. You know, we talked yesterday about Alan Davis, and I think yeah. Alan Davis is somebody, I mean, I can see, obviously, Olivier and Stuart, you know, you can see in, in your early work in particular, you know, but I, mm. I can see the DNA of Alan Davis in your stuff, and you're the only other artist I've ever seen, you maybe even use it more than him, in that fisheye lens, you know, where you mm. have, you, you pick really strange shots sometimes, and they really work, and I'd be terrified to draw that, because I know I would mess it up, but you you somehow just get it, you know, you really nail a great shot and you get so much information in without crowding it. And Alan Davis was the master of that, wasn't he? He was, he was amazing at just making it, it was easy on the eye even when he was giving you all this information. Mm. I like the, the work of Alan, but but I think it probably he's working in Excalibur, it's like, it's another age. I mean, you can yeah. get out with a lot less uh, backgrounds, a lot less details. Yeah. And I think all of that, uh, was broken when you guys did the ultimates yeah. <laughs> and you doom us all <laughs> you know with those panels the, the the cinematic panels who was the choice of doing that it was brian or it was yours your oh, idea brian. Brian. Well, brian had already been drawing like that for a couple of years like him warren yeah. warren ellis um mm -hmm. they were an amazing team and they had done the authority the first year yeah. the prior to that but they'd also worked on stormwatch i think they did at least three issues together but they did three issues where Brian was starting to sort of experiment with this big budget looking panoramic style, but he perfected it in the authority, like in the authority, he just nailed it. And I remember we talked about lots of other potential artists for the Ultimates, and I was saying to Joe Quesada, it has mm -hmm. to be Brian Hatch. He's the only guy who can capture what this has to be. And, and it sounds crazy to say cinematic because cinematic is such a cliche now when every one of these things is on camera, you know, but but they you, you have to remember nobody had seen Iron Man fly in real life or, you know, Thor on camera. This was years before that. So Brian yeah. really captured that, didn't he? He gave it something nobody had ever done before, I think. Mm, that's, I used cinematic because it was like the, the frame was continuous. I mean, it, it didn't vary the frame. I mean, there was 
very little inserts, like small panels. It was like the, the big panels, four per page or three per page. And, yeah. and it was like that. The rhythm was very cinematic as well. I mean, you, you have the feeling of seeing the movie or the storyboard of the movie or, yeah. or whatever. So you started doing that and you include all these references, the photo references, and suddenly everyone was that. In the, <laughs> Every editor wants that kind of reference and the readers, they are used to that. It's like, okay, uh, if I see a car, I need to see their car, you yeah. know? And they, they, you change the comics. And, well, uh, I mean, now we have to put more effort on that. I mean, <laughs> we have to draw a lot of, a lot of I, things. I mean, if you watch Brian's interview, you know, from a few weeks back, Brian has that crippling anxiety about his work as well. And what fascinated me was the last interview we did, number 17, Travis Charest, who's one of the great, probably the greatest draftsmen of all time, you know. Mm -hmm. He's agonizes about his stuff and Frank quietly yeah. does. It's insane. You know, like I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, these guys are god tier, god tier guys, and yet they worry about their pages. It's crazy. I mean, That's it's, like slow, you know? it's nice when you think about it. It's like, okay, I'm suffering, but I know that uh, Travis Charles and Brian Heath they are suffering too. <laughs> and at the same time, it's like desperating. Like, pff, no. <laughs> I mean, even if I got, if I get to be that good, yeah. I'm gonna be still suffering. <laughs> <It's> like, oh my. <laughs> So who do you feel like? Who, who do you feel like your sort of mother and father in terms of who uh, inspired you to to draw in a particular style? Like, because like we talked about yesterday, everybody learns by cop tracing the masters as children, you know. And then you 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 feel even in your earliest work, you can still see your your influences. And then you move beyond your influences. But who who do you think were your big influences in terms of putting a page together? Well, right now, um, because. Uh... I think that all a, a people a person can only talk about the reference he has right now because it's always shuffling between things. I mean, your interest variates, and the things that interested me like three years ago or four years ago, I'm I, I'm past all that, so I'm interested in new things. Right now, uh, one of the best artists in 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 comic books, who's uh, Alvaro Martinez Bueno. You know this guy. The guy that made the Alvaro Martinez, the guy who made the Nice House on the Lake series. Oh, I, I, I've got that, but not read it because I heard the book is terrific. I, I, loads of people have recommended it, and it's on my big to read pile. But as, as the artwork, yeah. Yeah, yeah, grab that one if you can. Grab that one because well, I've got it in the house. I have it here somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, this guy is, is like opening paths in the jungle for me. It's like okay, he's he's doing things that I never saw in comics. It's like. Okay, yeah, he he developed an, a completely different style in like two weeks or something. He was doing comics for DC with an inker. He he stopped working with the inker, start doing everything digitally for the nice house on the lake, and suddenly he has this style, very painter uh, like painting style or something, but very classic. And at the same time, was super textured and new, and was like wow, and that kind of thing. I I like it because you can see the freshness. Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to leave my pages and in, in pencil and and not inking. Yeah, uh, like few years back, I was absolutely into inking. I was studying Mike Morales and 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 all the good inkers in the um, Al Williamson. I was studying all kind of that because it was everything into inking. Right now, I'm I'm like, if I can find a way to finish the pencils and not inking anymore, <laughs> I, I think I will go to that. So this is something that interested me in the past i observed it and i'm grateful for that and, and now i'm in in, yeah. in other stuff what I, what i really like about the comics is to bring references from outside the comics you know i studied art history and probably it's because of that you know i, I wanted to study fine arts but they rejected me twice <laughs> twice you have to, you have like a like um like a level pass or something and an exam to to access to the fine arts academy and they rejected me twice so i say okay i got the message <laughs> so i went to study art history and and it's nice because you have a lot of references in inside your head uh for example when i did house of x uh for the mask of um what is the name of that uh this character, the, the wife of uh, Mystique. Uh, I don't remember the name. Oh, I don't know. I haven't read The wife of Mystique. Is, 
Destiny, I think it's oh, Destiny. Right. Okay, you know, the, the mask of Destiny, I, I modeled it after Constantin Brancusi, which is a Romanian sculptor based in Paris in the early 20th century. Yeah. So that kind of references I like to I like to put in the comics, you know. I think comics is more interesting when people bring in something that you haven't seen in comics before, isn't it? So yeah. even Doctor Doom is based in the 1960s on the, the man in the iron mask. Visually, you know, the Hulk is based on Frankenstein. So they were looking at things from outside of comics that had an exciting visual. And, and we have that now, like Belson Kevich, my God, he reinvents himself every five minutes. He's amazing. He's always coming in with something you haven't seen before. But do you mm -hmm. think, do you think um, it's funny, I was talking to a friend last night. She's not a comic fan, um, but she occasionally picks up comics. And she was reading recently a lot of Dave McKean, Belson Kevich, those late 80s guys, you know. And uh, she said she could not believe the invention because she thought of comics as very... You know, comic booky, this the style that people from outside of comics imagine. Mm. But she couldn't believe the beauty and the invention of these guys. Do you think there's still room in comics for that kind of thing from an artist's point of view? Or do you think companies now try and shoehorn you into a house style? Because we see a lot of artwork that looks kind of similar. Do, do you think there's a pressure from Marvel and DC to to be Jim Lee or to to be Koi Pell mm. or whatever, you know, whatever is the fashionable style at the moment? I don't know exactly what to say to that. I mean, from a, an artist's point of view, I, I I love some kind of art and I I try to to follow that current because I like it. Um, or when I was trying to fit in, in in Marvel, trying to fit when I was starting. So I was looking at the the guys I like the most, like Stuart or Olivier, and trying to follow that current because I was like, okay, this is so in, so much interesting for me and and I want to to go in in that kind of in this wave but um it I think it's more like something I will do as an artist rather than an editor would tell me no no you have to draw this way I think it's a lot of factors here I mean we have also, also the the representative the rep, how do you say the reps mm -hmm. reps right that uh, they are used to sell some kind of art and they have like this automatic selling. It's like, okay, I'm going to represent these guys that draw similar so I can put them very easily to work. So I don't have to work too much to find work for these guys. And at the same time, an editor that needs a replacement for a certain artist that can look for something like like something similar. And and that creates a feeling like, okay, the, the house style. But uh, Apart from when I I was doing the, the Thor pages after Pascual, I think never told me in my career, like, you have to draw like this. I mean, my my turning from cartoon style to realism was absolutely my my choice because I thought I it was more fitting inside Marvel. Yes. Yeah. No. But uh, I see a lot of people with different styles, like yeah. Javier Rodriguez, Natasha Bustos, Marcos Martin. They have different styles completely. From the standard superhero narrative or the standard superhero comic, and they are working too. So no, I, I don't think. I think every every style has uh, has a chance. Yeah. But uh, also every style must have a good story to tell. I mean, you know, the style have to match with the story. If you make a cartoon of Dark Devil Born Again, it's probably not going to work. It will be something worth seeing, but probably it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, I, it's something I obsess over as a writer to make mm. sure that I pick the right artist to work with on a particular project. Like you say, because if somebody compliments it, it makes the project ten times better than it was in your head. And if it's the wrong guy, it's like casting the wrong actor in a movie, isn't it? It just feels wrong from page one. I think I'm generally lucky. I mean, I've been cursed with this really good taste in comic book art. Yeah. So I've only ever worked with the good guys, but it's kind of spoiled. Like I would find it impossible yeah. now to work with somebody who's not amazing, I think. <laughs> I mean, I told you yesterday, but um, you kind of constructed this feeling that the, when you select some artists to work with you, yeah. it's like kind of uh, like a kind of badge of honor. That the, It's like, okay, I don't, wear, I don't want to win some prizes. I want to work with this guy. I mean... You selecting me to work with you was like like a huge compliment for me. That the foremost, it was a compliment that you were interested in my work and and you wanted to work with me. It was like wow, 
okay, so I'm I'm really been doing something good, you know. That well, kind you of have, thing. yeah, you really have. I mean, the, I told you yesterday, the, you but it was a really really difficult decision because I knew I was going to make this project for a long time, for years. I've been thinking about it. But the challenge with doing a crossover book, you know, for people who don't know, Big Game is the sequel to Wanted, which was the first Miller yeah. World book 20 years ago. So it's really important. You know, that's the alpha and the omega. It's the beginning and the end of that big story. And so this is the return of Wesley Gibson and those characters. But what, to make it even bigger, I wanted to have Kingsman, Kick-Ass, Magic Order, everything all in this book. Now, the challenge with that is, one, to write a story that feels natural, to have them all together. But because the artists who worked on those books were Frank Quitely, you know, like uh, Olivia Coipel, I mean, the greatest artist in the world, to have the second guy to draw those characters draw them badly would be yeah. horrific. Because every sense in your body would tell you this is a step down if, if it wasn't somebody great. So yeah. I really thought for a couple of years, who I need to find the right guy for this project. And, and then as if by magic, you appeared. And I mean, I knew before you started it was... I don't want to interrupt you, but uh, you're high complimenting me. I mean, you're like, I'm blushing and uh, <laughs> and I don't want to interrupt, but uh, but please, I, I mean, my, uh, how can I say that? My, my feeling were like, I'm deeply honored to do this book because I love all the previous material and eventually I read them all. I mean, I tried to read them before starting, but uh I didn't have the time, so I read them all eventually when I was doing the the comics, and I was I was flattered, I was honored, and at the same time I was like, okay, like big capital letters in front of my eyes say, don't screw it up, <laughs> <laughs> because, because it was like a masterclass in frustration. It's like, okay, you're never going to be as good as Olivier, or 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 because. <laughs> What I perceive of their work, their work is the final work. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't see the struggle they were through to do the final work. Yeah. I don't know anything but the final work. And I I always love more uh, a final work. I, I find that when when how can I say I'm I'm being confusing. Um oh you left. Just <laughs> 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 Let me restart with with better English, with better words. <laughs> um, when I see my work, I see my process, and I see all the bad choices I I took or the good choices I took. But I, but I see the process. When I see other guys' work, I see the final work, and I love it. Yeah, my work is never gonna like me. I'm gonna never gonna like my work as much as other guys' work because I see the final thing is like wow, okay, yeah, this is finished. This is fantastic. So. It, Doing being the second guy drawing these characters, it was like a, a masterclass in frustration because I was looking at the Stuart Dimon and Page or, or Olivier or Travis or or Frank Whiteley. I mean, it, it was like I, I grew up with these guys, <laughs> so so it was like okay, don't screw it up, do do the best you can, but you are not going to be that good anyway. <laughs> so it was like relax. <laughs> and your style is so different. Yeah. For example, from John John Romita Jr. has a very mm. distinct Johnny Jr. style. Mm. And Frank Whiteley is very much him too, you know. So so when you're drawing these characters, you have to make it look like the characters people have only ever seen one artist draw, but also make them all fit together so it doesn't look as if it's been done by 17 different artists. Yeah. You, know, you have to blend it with your own style. Uh, was that a challenge? Well, it was, it was a challenge to get the character right. I mean, to get the right personality of the character. I mean... Uh... I especially remember the well some pages because we're we have some characters that show up very little and we have only we see them for a couple of pages or so. And it's like, okay, I need to convey the feeling of one whole book in one or two pages. Um and this is uh, this was quite of a challenge, but uh, I remember the the um, Kika's uh, scenes. You know, when, when he's like dealing with all the stuff in his mind, I, I draw him with a lot of stuff around. You you can see the pages. It's, it's, in, it's in the room and it's, it's like with a lot of things. You have the bike and you have the books and you have the blah, blah, blah. blah. And when he, he fits it, in, oh, uh, maybe I'm, I'm revealing some things, but when it clears the mind, you make the, the background completely black and he's like, okay, he, he dissipated all the doubts. He's, he's where he should be. 
So that kind of stuff, I, I like it. So use the background to tell the story of the characters. For example, all the industrial thing I, I made around, around the fraternity, you can see all the backgrounds, they are super industrial. It's like, you don't want to live there. You don't want to live with these guys. It's not something you want to, to love. It's, it's super hard. It's like, um, because I thought it was nice to express that these guys, they are, they are not nice. You're, you don't want to, you don't want to be there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's funny because the way you drew Wesley Gibson, who in the movie was played by James McAvoy, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't look, I, I wonder if your choice was going to be to make him look like 20 years on James McAvoy as James looks now in middle age. You know, mm -hmm. we went for a different look. It was a much harder look, which I think really worked because James still looks quite boyish, even though he's in his forties. That, yeah. um, but you you made him look like a, you know, an absolute thug. You know, he looked like still a it was, it was because of the reference you sent me about the the belts and the yeah. leather. Or something I I saw this this guy that is wearing that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and I thought he was a perfect actor for for this role. Um, I I don't remember the name of the guy, but it was like um. The 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 hair he was uh, like uh, combat like back uh, yeah. to the back of the head and the white beard and something, and to this day I have to confess that I don't know if my version of Wesley has the short hair or not. <laughs> I don't know because uh, almost every 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 panel I did with him is yeah. like in a in a low angle, right? So you don't see the hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, to this day, I don't know. I mean, if you if you ask me to to draw him from from a bob, I, I don't know if he has the short hair or not, or I don't know. <laughs> it's weird because every panel I did with him is like, okay, let's 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 think about this guy. <laughs> let's think about the hair of this guy, and and I I don't have an answer. I don't know. Was there any character that didn't suit your style as you were drawing it that you had to work twice as hard on? No. Was there uh, felt easy? Was there any that felt very natural for you? Uh, I had that really great time with Hit Girl. Really Hit good. Girl. Because she moves very, like, she's very agile and, and she's moving with the style all the time. And I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I, I had a very great time with her. I, Those I bet... Her with King, Eggsy from Kingsman were amazing. Those were the yeah. back shooting and everything. It's great. Yeah, I have some good reference pics I took of myself in a sofa with, uh, you know, in the scene that is in the in the back of the car. Yeah, and you have to see those pictures. They are ridiculous, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all fat in my sofa. <laughs> no, but it was like uh, with Hit Girl, I based my version very much, of course, in the Goran Parlov version, probably much more than in the Romita Junior because it's more uh, grown up. Yes. So yeah. the Goran version was perfect for me. It was like my reference for for all things. And, and it was fantastic. I mean, yeah, that, that book is, is great. Hit Girl in Tokyo is? I think yes, it's good. and Dan Daniel Wade wrote the script. It's a really good book. I, I'm, I was really happy with that. It turned out great. And uh, who else? I mean, I, I remember I had a, a trouble with Huck because I didn't know I want to make it like badass or very nice guy. I think it's a nice guy, Huck. And uh, and at the same time, he wanted to be like imposing, but a nice guy, but I didn't want to look dumb. And it was like, okay. And it was studying the Raphael uh, panels a lot. Like, okay, he makes it really good. I mean, he has this good person look, you yes. know? The look in the eyes, like a good person. It's like, okay, I, I have to get that. Yeah. That's, we're doing the TV show, fucking, and casting him is going to be really interesting from that yeah. point of view because he has to be a big guy, but not look dopey, but not look badass. Is, is there's... I have a suggestion. <laughs> yeah, actually, I have a suggestion for the cast. Have you seen The Expanse? No, never, no. No, the, the series of uh, sci-fi? No. There is a character named Amos that I think is perfect. Oh, all right. Yeah, I, will, I will send you some pictures later. Yeah. It's perfect. I mean, that guy is, is hack. Really? Well, is he a big guy? Yeah. I think he's a big guy. Yeah. Cool. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, that could be amazing. So, you know you'll get no money for this. You'll, at best, get a thank you. <laughs> You know, I think the signal's breaking up. Let me open this door and see if that helps. Okay. Oh, better. That's that's it. I think, like I say, we're in our holiday place, and the signal 
it's like the third world or something like that. You know, it's yeah. impossible to. Is, yeah. is that going to be? Uh, we seem to be back again. Is it cold in Scotland? Is it cold? It's actually not too bad. No, it's, I mean the thing is, I'm like you know some guy born in the North Pole, so I never yeah. feel cold. Like, see, even when I go to London, I have That's... to. I sleep on top of the covers and a pair of underpants and everything. I'm sweating. And uh, any country outside of Scotland, I'm sweating. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, I lived in Canada uh, one year, yeah. uh, and I was living in Ottawa, yeah. and and the thing is, like, I like the cold. I like the cold, not that much, of course. But I I was working in my in my office in Canada with the window a bit open. It was like mi minus thirteen or minus twenty yeah. <laughs> degrees, but I wanted to have it a bit open. Yes. You know. <laughs> because I don't want to be very comfortable in the place I work. Because it's the place I work. And when I finish working, I don't want to be comfortable there. I want to go out. I so can't I work in the heat, though. I, I think it has to be a little cold for me to feel that I need yeah. to get some work done. If it's hot, I feel I should take the day off and go outside. So I like mm. it to be a little bit cold. You know what? Scotland, the coldest I ever remember it here was minus 20 or something in my hometown. And I was in the pub one night, and there was a guy I didn't really know him. I, I knew of. And he said, oh, minus 20, that's nothing, it's okay. And he, he left his jacket in the pub. He was trying to show how tough it was. And he said, I'm just going to walk home, you know. And we were like, are you out of your mind, you know, because you walk 10 steps and you just froze. And, and he died, <laughs> he died that night. You know? right? Yeah, he died on the way home. So. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I mean, it's, it's sad, but it's, it's kind of hilarious. I mean, <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm, I don't know what the moral of that story is, you know, but like, yeah, well, the moral of that story is like minus 20 is, is fucking cold. Yeah. <laughs> but it did yeah. seem pretty cool. It did seem pretty cool at the time. I was really impressed when he walked off in a t shirt. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it was the, the last moment of his life was pretty cool. <laughs> like that. What more can you ask? What more can you you know, ask? There is this saying, like, okay, between minus. Uh, 20 and minus 40 ah, yeah. there is no difference you're not going to feel the difference believe me you're going to feel the difference <laughs> we had one day of minus 40 yeah. and uh, we went from our house to the pub in in Ottawa yeah. it was like 10 minutes walking and when I when I entered the pub I didn't feel my legs it's like okay <laughs> I don't feel it because it's with the cold this is something really weird because you can put some 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 layers over you but always in the upper half Yes. You are always in your, your trousers is the same in summer, winter, or minus 30 degrees or minus 20 degrees. Because then you, you enter in the in the in the pub and you're not going to take the trouser. You know, <laughs> it's like no, you, you take the coat off, but the trouser stays the same. Yeah. So it was like minus 40 degrees with the same trousers. It was like fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so cold, man. I've got this sweater that I bought 20 years ago, right? And no matter how cold it is or how hot it is, it's fine. And it's yeah. not an expensive sweater. It costs like £10 or something, right? Yeah. But see if it's really cold, I'm like, it's okay, I've got the sweater. I call it super <laughs> jumper, right? And I put it on. And my kids, it's like a legend for the children, you know? And I'm always worried something happens to the sweater. <laughs> it's an Elvish sweater, you know? <laughs> Elvish. <laughs> you have it like the, like the clothes of Frodo and Sam, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's what, for what a vacation. In Canada? I didn't know you were out in Canada. What were you doing out there? Yeah. Well, my, my girlfriend, uh, she was working in uh, in the embassy. Right. So that's why from, you know, all, the whole Canada, we chose Ottawa for living. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, I love the place, but the, you have Montreal, you have Toronto, and you have Vancouver or Calgary. Ottawa is a, it's a very... Trunk, uh, it's, it's, it's a very quiet place. It's like nothing happens in Ottawa ever. <laughs> so it was it was fantastic. I mean, it was one of the years I remember with with more like love in in my life because it was everything was a discovery and and I was very comfortable there. What year? What year was that? Uh, sorry. Uh, how long ago was that? No, it was one year. I had a visa for one year. Was it a long time ago? It was like uh, in 2015, yeah. Oh, right. So you, you were at Marvel, you were working. Yeah, I was doing the Star Wars thing. Right, right. We talked so about this last night as well, you know, because Star Wars, it was really weird, wasn't it? Because that was probably the last time everybody was picking up a Marvel book, you know, like that was a really big deal whenever Marvel had those the Star Wars license back from Dark mm. Horse. And they sold a million copies, I think, in the first one. Was that quite exciting or was it a bit of a headache because... You know, you have to do these likenesses that have to get approved and all that kind yeah. of stuff. Well, actually, um, 
it was weird because um you know they they launched the the star wars wave in the, of comics in marvel with four uh series only yeah. four and it was like star wars with Casaday, jason yeah. aaron Casaday, uh leia with terry dodson yeah. and uh vader with salvador de la roca I mean, La Roca. I, I cannot pronounce in Spain, Salvador La Roca. I don't know why I'm making La Roca. But the, <laughs> yeah. And the, the four, they, they were all legends. I mean, yeah. the three of them, they were like well-established, renowned artists in the industry. I mean, it made sense. And suddenly it was like, okay, and uh, Kanan with Greg, with Greg Weisman, he was the, the creator of Gargoyles. Yeah. And, and me. And it was like, anyway... <laughs> Hello, I'm here again. <laughs> <laughs> and the people, who is this guy? Like, hey. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I guess it was probably because I was working with Jordan White in the in with Deadpool in the X Offices, yeah. and he 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 became <laughs> um, the editor of Star Wars. Yeah. So he, he grabbed the guys he had in the in the office, and that's why I got the job. But it was it was great. I mean, I remember they they sent me the email. Uh, about like hey you're going to do a star wars and it was like yeah and it was about uh to go to the nice convention in in bedford oh yeah so it was in a plane i was in the plane so i remember i read the email it was like good i'm gonna tell everyone and it was like switch off your phone we're going to take off <laughs> <laughs> i was like two hours without being able to tell anyone that it was going to do a star wars and it was like i want to tell everyone <laughs> yeah <laughs> And it, it was, was so cool that it was before Star Wars kind of, you know, fell off a cliff a little bit, you know, but that 2015 period, the comics mm -hmm. were amazing. The movie was so, the first movie was a really good movie. Yeah. I actually enjoyed the first one. Yeah. And uh, and it was, it was exciting. It was sold a ton of copies. And then you went to X-Men, you know, from there, you you you, you know, you, you were working with Hickman. Yeah, well, after that, I, I, I went to do the Avengers for a couple of years. I mean, I did um, one year of uh, Uncanny Avengers. Yeah. Because my focus was like always to work in the in the mutants. It's like, okay, give me the X-Men. Like, no, we cannot give you the X-Men yet. It's like, okay. So they gave me Uncanny Avengers because they have a lot of mutants on the Uncanny Avengers. There was Rogue and Deadpool and Cable. And yeah, there was like, uh, I think Quicksilver was there as well. So it was like, okay, you're going to do mutants, um, but um, not the X-Men. So... Then I did an event book, came uh, Avengers No Surrender, and then they put me in a, um, yeah, it was like an uh, an event book named Extermination. Yeah. And that was my, my point of entry with the, with the X-Men. So it's nice because I got to draw what I wanted, which was the man, the manor, the, you know, the mansion with the, all the, 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 the beast laboratory and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I, I wanted to draw that. It's like, yeah, I want to, I want to do that. And then uh, we made the Hickman thing and we destroyed all that <laughs> and started the new thing. And that made me look for another kind of references and and to learn to draw different things, you know, like, uh, okay, you're going to draw um, plants and, you know, uh, new architecture, like super contemporary architecture based on organic shapes and everything. It was, I had to learn a lot drawing that series that yeah. stuff looks amazing though like uh, i mean that's a combination of technology and nature yeah. you've never seen anything like it it was really quite artistically revolutionary wasn't it it was it was, it was something that um if you look for concept art or movies or something you you, you have seen something similar in, in some movies but never uh, i think that nobody put that in 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 a comic yet yeah. so the challenge was to do something that was like um you know opposite to the fraternity is like some some place you want to be yeah. but at the same time it's not going to be anything human not remotely human it doesn't have to look like human so my my challenge was like they barely asked me about that they they left me like room to draw it's like okay you draw this <laughs> it's like draw whatever you want and and i came with all these designs and you know that kind of craziness because it's, that's what I like about a book. Uh, when when I start working in a book, I need to turn it a lot to make it my own project. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I'm always working work for hire. All my career is work for hire, so I don't have books of my own yet. 
So every book I do, I try to turn it in a personal work, yeah. you know, to give my my vision on that. It's like, that's why my designs of characters always try to be like completely different or something because it's like more a fantasy book than a superhero book. You know, I'm never gonna, you're gonna never, you're never gonna see me drawing the pyjama, you know, with the cave or everything. Not, not, not in a design I will do. I will do a different design. I will do something more challenging or something like that. Why, why haven't you dipped your toe into the creator-owned waters? Because the path that Will Eisner and Frank Miller always recommend to people is, you know, make your name at Marvel and DC, mm -hmm. a ton of readers, and then go off and take those readers into your own work. Have you never had that itch to go and do your own thing? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, the thing is like, I'm, I've been like, uh, in exclusive contracts oh. from uh, almost the beginning. I mean, it was a couple of years without the exclusive contract, and then I have my first one. And before I I finished the contract, I had the second one, and I think with the John Gunn program, it came the the third one. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm not getting any faster, so I'm I'm getting slower. So I still have some issues to do. And and yeah, I mean, after that, I will I will love to explore. I mean, I'm super happy, Marvel. I, I'm very well treated, and and I love everyone there. But it's the only place I know. Yes, it's something I I, I feel about the industry is like, I it's been twelve years, and and the 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 book with you is the first time I do outside of Marvel. I think that can give you a nice creative buzz. You know, like it's like moving house or buying a new wardrobe or something, isn't it? Like. I think that just having different things to play with is is rejuvenating. So have, yeah. have, you, have you ever considered working at DC? Have they ever spoken to you? Uh, that's weird because they, uh, I will assume somebody will, will reach eventually, but uh, it was like not too much. I mean, probably they know I'm exclusive or something, but no, or maybe oh, they are. Not that won't stop them. That won't stop them. Because what, what the trick is you phone up and say, like, when is your exclusive over and we can steal you? Yeah. I end. mean, some years ago, but a lot of years ago, like in 16 or something, 2016 or something, I, I get some emails like, okay, are you exclusive yet? And eventually I get some, some emails of people, you know, like trying. Yeah. But um, not from DC, actually. It's maybe. Maybe I'm revealing too much about my negotiation. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, no. I'm very, um, I'm being very honest. And and this each about trying new things and and making books outside the superhero market is 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 not because I'm in bad terms with Marvel or anything. I mean, I'm 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 very good terms with Marvel. It's, it's my home. I mean, I, I, they raised me. I feel like the like a child of Marvel. I mean, they raised me and. And I'm super grateful, but at the same time, as an artist, you 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 feel the need like, okay, now I have a kid, now I want to have something of mine, probably, you know. I do think though as well, like, um, there's a few reasons for jumping even between the big two, because I think right now is actually a good time to be in Marvel or DC. I think that the industry kind of wants that. Like I noticed years ago that. There's a five-year window. Everybody will hate this, but it's true. There's a five-year window every 20 years, roughly, where people need mm -hmm. new characters. They really want new characters. And you get them outside of that, but there tends to be, from 1938 to 1943, the entire DC universe was created, pretty much. Marvel, mm -hmm. you know, it was the early 60s. 2008 to 2013, you had all the modern big creator-owned projects, you know, mm -hmm. from Cast through to Saga and everything. Uh, and even... Uh, Back in 1988 to 1993, you had Sin City, Hellboy, all these kind of things all coming up. So there seems to be a five-year window roughly roughly every 20 years when this happens. But the rest of the time, I think the industry quite likes consolidation. And I think this is a period right now where it's been a long time since there's been a lot of excitement across a number of books at Marvel and DC. There's a few good books at Marvel and DC. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you need 10 good books or 15 good books coming out from each company to encourage people into stores. And I do think that's something that's missing. But I think you also need to replenish what you're working on. I think if you've just done 10 years at Marvel, go and do something at DC because year 11 at Marvel is not a news story. You know, mm. and I say that to my friends at DC as well as like, you know, don't do 15 years at DC, go and try five years at Marvel and, and you'll feel better for mm. it. Yeah. And readers will yeah, be because, 
Yeah, they always say like it's the same. No, it's the same. Marvel and DC, you know, superheroes is the same. I think it's completely different. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you see the books from one on the other, and it's like, no, 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 it's not the same thing. Yeah, I mean, you the you know, the characters. Hmm. I think Justice League should be amazing on iHeart. Hmm. Well, I, I hope to I hope to be able to try at some point. I mean, you you have I tell you that I have a lot of trouble drawing Batman. Oh really? You never told me that. <laughs> I always say that I never draw Batman. I draw guys dressed like Batman, <laughs> <laughs> which is a huge difference. I mean, it's, it's subtle, but it's huge. You know, it's like you, when you see uh, Mahmoud Asrar's Batman, which yeah. I love. Yeah. Uh, he made a Batman uh, book like the last year, and he's like, "Wow, you really draw Batman," you know? Yeah. Or, or uh, I don't know. They are very good Batman artists. Alvaro Martinez makes a great Batman. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, this is the Batman. And when I draw Batman, it's like, mm, 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 it's not the Batman. <laughs> so if if I have time, I'm gonna make a lot of uh, like an Inktober only of Batman. <laughs> <laughs> used to learn i mean it was i was thinking about that the last year like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna do the inktober only about batman but then i never had the time but yeah i would love to try those characters because new characters force you to find new languages and new languages create new resources yeah. so it's, it's a very good wheel i mean try new things and and they you will have to develop new skills yeah. to, to do those things so yeah yeah. I think, you know, when I hear friends of mine who've worked on a Marvel book for years and then they jump onto another Marvel book and then another one for three years, then in year 12, when they jump on yet another Marvel book, I just think you're just reshuffling the deck chairs, you know, it's like, yeah, go, go elsewhere, you know, and I think that um, DC people are the same. There's guys I know who've done their whole career at DC, and I think, how exciting would it be to suddenly see? I mean, imagine Frank quietly drawing Spider-Man. Like I can't even almost visualize that as so cool. Okay, but and you going over and doing Justice League with Jason Aaron or something, I, I would I would love to see that. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, it, it could be great if they they make a, a pact or something and they have to shuffle even for two no, years yeah. <laughs> for two years. Like all the people in Marvel go to DC and all the people in DC go to Marvel and they make a mess and they have to go back and 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 <laughs> fix the things. I mean, it's a good idea. You know, they could do that. <laughs> They break completely the universe, and they okay. <laughs> into, you, they go out. <laughs> and it, it a, a really good range of writers, and actually all good guys as well. Like I mean, the way I only work with the good artists, but you seem to only work with the good writers. You know, like Jason Aaron's great, Hickman's great, Matt Fraction's great. You know, like I, I and Bendis, you worked with Bendis obviously on Spider Man as well. So, I but do. they're very different, and the, oh, obviously me, yeah. but but they're very different, very very different types of writers. You know, yeah. everybody's very unique. I mean, Hickman's nothing like Bendis, and Bendis is nothing like me. You know, how did that feel? Like, do you do you do you feel you bring a different thing to to these projects when you're working with these guys, or does it feel? Hmm. Is there a I, I think I can only I can only talk about the guys, uh, which uh, with I uh, which uh, with I made like a long run, like five issues or so, because when you do a couple of issues, you you barely get to uh, get used to the voice of the of the writer i mean it's like two issues is not enough to get used to the character or, or to get used to the way of one guy drawing uh writing the character so yeah with Matt fraction was super nice and uh and i like the way he wrote the script for me <laughs> you know he, he was addressing me in the script it was the first time i saw that i remember it was very impactful like hey pepe i want you to do this and then I went you to do that, and it was like, okay, it's great, um, because no nobody told me, nobody, I never read that script about, um, you know, writing written for me, yeah, you know, when when you are a, a, a you know work for higher artists and you are in the beginning, they they deliver the scripts and the editor gives the script to anyone, so probably the the writer doesn't know who is gonna draw that that thing, but when you are doing like a series, it's like yeah, yeah. It, they know that you are going to do it. And uh, yeah, I remember that in doing Thor, Matt Fraction, they wrote me a, a paragraph like saying, um, you know, you know what I want for this page? I want run to the hill. I don't mind them, run to the hill. So if you don't have it, give me your address. I'm gonna I'm gonna record a copy, I'm gonna send it to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
And with Jason Aaron was fantastic because um, I wanted to do that series with him, like Wolverine and the X-Men was Wolverine and the X-Men. And I wanted to do that series. I was like super a oh, huge fan of that that series. And they gave it to me. It's like, okay, you're going to do the series you wanted with the mutants and Jason Aaron. I was like, <sighs> and I was so impressed by by the, the you know the opportunity that the first issue is a mess <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I i i yeah i collapsed i collapsed now the, the first issue is so bad and yeah I, I totally collapsed but then i i yeah, i get on my feet again and you know the next issues are better and uh, i like the dialogues and i like the, the the challenge of a lot of characters speaking in one panel right you know, it's it's kind of a hell to draw, but at the same time, it takes discipline and makes you think about okay, this guy is gonna talk first, and then this one, and then this one, and then this one talks again. So yeah, I need to leave we a space here, here. So it's it's a very particular skill yeah. to manage the the group uh, books, you know. I feel you know, Ben always makes me laugh because I feel he never even takes that into consideration. I think he yeah. has everybody all talking over each other and everything doesn't. Yeah. So. Did you did you think about that, or did you know did you try and make that work, you know, and put more panels in so that the dialogue was broken up a little? Or? You know what happens. I mean, the the comics they are they are like a um, like a well. You know, the 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 well you can you can fall, yeah. and you can fall as deep as you want. I mean, you can you can be thinking about okay, I'm gonna think about the the ergonomy of the page, so the the eyes are gonna move from here to there and there there. And, and I'm gonna draw some everything so you it's gonna be very natural. Yeah. And then I'm gonna leave room for dialogue. And then I'm gonna leave, you know, this kind of point of view here is gonna be also in the last panel, it's gonna be the same point of view. So you can become crazy with that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, comics, they allow you to become crazy. It's yeah. like, yeah, everything you want to do, you can do. And everything the crazy you want to go, you can. <laughs> so I try I try to encourage that. I try to get yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you try you you try that we make the best panel we ever drawn in our lives. And and two pages after is again, no, no, this is the the best, you know. Forget that shit you did two days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I but never know that I'm doing that as well. And it's every artist I've ever worked with. I remember one time they were all sitting around the table in a pub at a convention and mm -hmm. they were it drives me crazy when he does this because he always <laughs> asks for the best page you've ever drawn. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, I mean, I'm drawing after all those guys in Mirror World and, and now I have to make the best uh, splash page I did in my life. It's like, oh man, the pressure is going to crash me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, but it, it was it was nice. I mean, it was what I was expecting about working with you. I mean, this this energy in the page. I mean, the way you, the way you write, the way you make the the dialogues, you know, the overconfidence of the of the characters. I mean, the people that say I'm gonna do this 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 thing, and he does it, <laughs> and he does it. It's like, yeah, I told you I was gonna do it. It was like, yeah, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> so I wanted to draw the thing. I mean, with that badass attitude, you know, and and I wanted to do that. I mean, when the action starts, you know, with Xy and Hit Girl, not revealing anything, but when the action starts, it's like. Yeah, I want this to look super cool, and and you know the pages, and uh, when they have this fight, they it has to look super cool, and and you have to be like, wow! But at the same time, you have very good drama, um, and and the investment of the characters. I mean, the the investment of the on the yeah the psychology of the characters and the the way they have the the troubles and they manage the troubles. They are very human troubles they have. So this is something I, I really love about your books. They are very human concerns and troubles, and they are deeply human. So that's why when, when you have this kind of fight, you don't want anyone to get hurt. It's like, no, 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 don't fight, guys. Don't fight. I, I love you guys. Don't fight. Yeah. <laughs> it's so important because an action scene means nothing. Yeah. And you worry about those guys, don't you? you know? So so the ultimates, people think of it as just action, but the ultimates had a lot of action in issue one. And a lot of action in issue five, and no action at all for two, three, and four. Really, there was almost no action. Um, yeah. It was just chat, but it made you fall in love with these characters. So when they were in the action, every punch was something to worry about. And 
Yeah, so yeah there's something that happened in the last uh, season of the Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. I mean, the last season wasn't very good, but uh, the investment of the previous seven seasons, yeah. you know, you love those guys. So when you see Jamie Lannister in one guy in one side of the battle and, and Jon Snow and the, and the others, like, I don't want any of these guys to suffer. <laughs> I love them both. Okay, don't break them. <laughs> so yeah, with with your character, it's the same. It's like you don't want anyone to get hurt because you, you made us love them, love them. You know. Yeah, and yeah, you know, we, we talked about this a little last night, but you know, you like I say, everybody's so aware of you from twenty fourteen. I know maybe twenty twelve as well, but to me, you were in the public consciousness twenty fourteen on in, in America. But you had mm -hmm. this whole career in Spain prior to that that Americans are probably unaware of. You know? Yeah. Well, I, I did a lot of job in Spain. I mean, uh, I don't know. When you are starting, I mean, this is something that has to do with the artificial intelligence that has been going on these these last years. Uh, uh, this this year has been like the the talking in in the industry was the artificial intelligence, and that concerns me because all the works I did before becoming a pro, or when I was becoming a pro. And an artificial intelligence can do it better than it did. You know, is the is the formative works, you know, the 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 works that make you become what you are. I mean, I I, I did a lot of stuff. I did uh, teenager comic books with a cartoony style. I, I made football comic books. I made uh, comic books about uh, job risks, you know, the wear the helmet, get the jacket, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I made all that uh, storyboards for, you know, advertising or everything. And all that, they were they, they were not very good jobs. But all that they make me the artist I am today. They they are contributive. So I'm I'm fearing about the, the I'm fearing for the the next generations of artists that probably are not going to get those kind of jobs because those kind of jobs are going to be assigned to artificial intelligence or something. And I'm worried about that because those works are necessary to to become a pro. You you cannot just enter in the comic books like H. I just arrived, you know. Hey, and I'm Gigi Cabenago. I, I draw like this. It's like <laughs> probably not. <laughs> Nobody's like that. I mean, probably Gigi's like that because he's a he's not a human being, he's an spiritual force, you know. Gigi. You met Gigi in the flesh. Uh, we haven't met in the flesh, but I've admired his work for so many years. And I, to get him to draw volume three of the Magic Order was like a dream because the Magic Order's been a very blessed project, you know, like either Olivia Coipel. Stuart Eminen, Gigi Cavanego, DK Ruan, and now the big final one I'm going to announce next year for the final volume. Okay. I mean, God, I mean, I've been lucky. You know, the guys I've worked with are, are really good. I, I can't wait to know who it's going to be. I'll, it's going I'll, to... I'll send you some copies. The, oh, yeah. I've, I've got about 20 pages of art. I'll send it to you tomorrow. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. This is a lot of people. You're going to make me very happy and ruin my, my oh, day. Oh, ruin your day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're going to do both. <laughs> You're gonna make me super happy and ruin my day. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, a lot of people don't know this, but you know, we all talk on Twitter and everything, but we all, we obviously have our little private conversations as well. Mm -hmm. There's a little group of us, there's maybe 20, 25 artists who I just love as people who are my friends, but also genius artists. Mm -hmm. And I think we we live in this weird world where we're sitting in houses miles away from each other. So it's nice all being in touch over these little groups. And anytime some new artwork comes in from Frank Quitely or somebody, you know, or, or Stuart Evan, I fire it out to everyone. I send it to the gang and then we all talk about it, Duncan Figredo and Sean Phillips and everyone. And it's, it's really nice, isn't it? It's kind of like a water cooler when you're working. It's nice to get a little break and all talk about what you like about each other's work. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was super nice because you include me in the in those mail threads and... Yeah. And it was, yeah, I, mean, I told you yesterday, but it was super weird when I look at my phone, like, hey, you have got mail. It's from, uh, I don't know, Duncan Fagredo. I was yeah. like, what? Or Dave Gibbons. I remember one day it was like, Dave Gibbons. It's like you you get an email from the Pope, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> send you an email, what? You know, Dave Gibbons? What? It was, it was super weird. But at the same time, it was, it was fantastic to, to hear you, them talking about what they like about the pages and what they yeah it was it was very good it's did you send the game the oh yeah yeah the, I, I don't know if i copied you in because you know sometimes it can be embarrassing but, for yeah, the yeah. but um i'm going to send them all five issues now that they're all done 
and lettered. Uh, I just got that in a couple of days ago, issue five. I'm going to send them all uh, the whole five issues, and I'll copy into that. But everybody's going to love it. But but don't, the, copy, the don't copy me because I'm going to be like, <laughs> or not. I'm going to be very embarrassed. Like, yeah, man, it's, no. is it intimidating? Like it? Or, is it inspiring or intimidating when you see someone who you love talking about your art? Yeah, inspiring yeah. or intimidating? It both. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm surprised when a when a person I admire in in comics or in art, yeah, they know me. They know my work. Uh, I'm I'm always surprised. I mean, it's like, oh no, yeah, I know who you are. It's like, oh, okay. And I have to swallow the 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 question like, what do you think? What do you think about? <laughs> because you have to play the pro, but at the same time, you want to ask, what do you think? You know. I was I was doing a signing session in in Ottawa when I was living there, yeah. and Catherine Imonem came came to see me. Catherine, the the wife of Stuart, which she's a, oh man, I I, I work with her in one issue of Journey into Mystery. And it's one of my favorite comics I did in my career because she writes so well, and she's so fun and is very intelligent woman, and she came. Uh, we we didn't met. Uh, until the end of the signing session that she, she came forward and said, hey, I only wanted to say hi, I'm Catherine. And I was like, <laughs> and she told me, yeah, Stuart loves your work. It was like, wait, <laughs> Stuart knows who I am. Yeah, okay, that's enough. <laughs> I don't want to know more. Yeah, because it's weird. The feeling of that you are uh, the last to arrive in the party. And also the Comic books, they are a very recent way of art. So the legends, they are still working when you get there. So when I got there and I was invited to Mexico, suddenly in Mexico was Alan Davis and I having a beer with Alan Davis. was like, <laughs> why? And it was fantastic because he's a super nice guy, super open and easy going. And, and you have, you can have a beer with Simon Bisley or Alan Davis or, and they are still active. And and that's fantastic because you go to the cinema and, and you admire some people that they are dead for a long time. Yeah. And in comics, you still have the legends around. And it's great because you can go to the source and, and talk to them. Like, hey, you did that. Why you did that? Or whatever. Yeah. And comic guys tend to live quite a long time with a few sad exceptions, but it's not unusual to find 95-year-old comic guys, you know, like Stan Lee, Steve Ditko, the cares, you know, a lot of these guys, John John Romita Sr., who just died recently. There's something, and even though we sit down all day, it's really weird that we seem to live a long time. So I, I really appreciate meeting those old guys. Like, I love it. There's nothing yeah. I love more than, I got a week with Will Eisner. Like, I got to spend a whole week with Will Eisner in Barcelona. Um, and we got, we hung out and we got on really well. It was great. And, you know, our families had dinner together at night and everything. It was, it was lovely. Great. And yeah. I... And comics is kind of like a little family, isn't it? Because there's not that many of us do this job, so it's always yeah. nice to help me up. Or that's what I love about doing this. You know, we can get a chance to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's you always discover new guys and new people. Uh, very interesting, and and the synergies they are they are created almost instant, instant, instantaneously. Yeah. You know, the the coolest story about meeting a legend. It was my my friend Ken Nimura. You know the guy that uh, the, he won the Eisner for, yeah. for Mami, and uh, he told me he ended up one night in a karaoke in Tokyo with Otomo. No. <laughs> it was like, okay, this is this is top of the game. You cannot go cooler than this. <laughs> <laughs> so Katsuhiro Otomo in a karaoke with my friend. It was like perfect. <laughs> okay, okay, you, you you are top of the game. Yeah. About, about twenty five years ago, I was in London. And Mobius was in an elevator that I walked into, and I instantly recognized him. He would have no idea who I am at all, you know. And we were only going down about three floors. It wasn't a very tall hotel. And I was trying to think of something to say, but I only had three yeah. stories to think of something. And I couldn't think of anything. And then he was gone. I was like, ah, you know, but I never got my moment with. You know, the amount of times that people will have have the same situation with you right i mean in elevator or something like hey i know it was mar miller i had to say something <laughs> i shared an elevator with kevin eastman in oh. mexico yeah and uh and i i toasted with the guy that created the tetris once oh really yeah 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 man oh, so was, you made a movie about that guy oh yeah 
Yeah, in the movie? Apple, on Apple, yeah. The, Ma- Matthew Vaughn and Taron Egerson and all the guys who did Kingsman. Um, mm-hmm. A movie about the creator of Tetris. Oh, it's, yeah. It's on Apple, Apple TV now, yeah. Okay, but yeah, I met, I met the guy because I was invited to a, a video game convention. I don't know why. Yeah. But they put me in a nice hotel, like a great, great hotel. And uh, we were dining inside the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. Right. But inside the museum, there, you know, in the main hall. And I was there looking at those guys of the video games. And I was, I was thinking about, I make comics. I hope nobody noticed because <laughs> they can throw me to the street. And, oh, no, you are not a video game artist. You are going out. <laughs> And then I met this guy who was a super nice guy. Yeah. Let's say Gastrovia. Yeah, that's it. The strangest guys I have ever met, and not as people, but just it was strange to see them, was uh, I was drunk one night at an American convention. I was going to bed about maybe 3 a.m. or something. I was coming in from a night. And I remember just pressing the button and the doors opening in the elevator. And I saw a hugely tall man. This was about 25 years ago. A hugely tall man, a tiny little man. And... Uh, a guy on a couple of crutches, and then this, uh, you know, C-3PO, basically, you know, Anthony Daniels. And I realized it was Darth Vader, Chewbacca, no. R2-D2, <laughs> and C-3PO. And I thought, am I, am I imagining this? Am I so drunk? You know? <laughs> yeah, what, like... what was amazing is Anthony Daniels was kind of telling off Kenny Baker as if, as if it was C-3PO telling off R2. They were angry about something. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, this is weird, you know, and then, and then the doors opened and I got off and yeah. I, I thought, this is, that's the strangest ride in my life. <laughs> I remember in, in Angoulême, I met one of the, the artists I, I like the most. It's, it's, a guy in, it's a guy that has a very little career in comics. He's yeah. more in, into concept art and, and, right. and he sings like the Black Frog. I think his name is Egon Alvar Chevalier or something like that. And I met the guy in, in Angoulême at, outside the pub, and I say, okay, I, I, I'm not the kind of guy that goes to the, you know, to the famous guys like, hey, can you sign my book? Yeah. But it was like, okay, we're in the convention in Angoulême. This is kind of expected. So, yeah. So I, I went to the guy and I say, hey, I bought your book. I love your work. And can you sign me the book? And he said, yeah, yeah. He was dressing like a, like a bear coat or something, you know, that four, four coat. Yeah. And he opens and he's dressed like a like an Usar or something, you know, from the from the French cavalry <laughs> with the 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 you know the belt here yeah. made of leather and something, and you know the, the military thing with the tattoos and everything was like holy shit, is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> he brought this this uh carbon thing to, to draw. I don't know the, the name, the charcoal. Yeah, and he, he pulls a knife like this big just to sharpen it. <laughs> And it was like, okay, I really wanted to meet this guy, and he's living up my expectations, all of them, you know. <laughs> Beautiful drawing, I have them. I have that in the book. It's super talented guy. It's, it's really, really cool. Yeah, no, I love it. And I, I still get a buzz from, you know, especially if it's an old time or somebody who you grew up with. It's such a thrill mm-hmm. to be with. I think I get such a, the more I work in Hollywood, you know, the, the appreciation I have of comic books, you know, like I really, I love the personalities in comic books. Everybody's unique, you know. Where is the mm. Hollywood Steranko? Where is the Hollywood Bill Sienkiewicz? Where is the Hollywood, you know, Stan Lee, really? You know, like, or Jack Kirby. I think that comic guys are, are so interesting. Like, I love hanging out with them. Yeah. I think it's because of the, the amount of time we spend alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're all a little crazy. But you have, you're living in both worlds. I mean, you're meeting people in the movies that they are... I mean, people in the movies should be super interesting or they are more business or what do you think about them? Um, it's, a, it's a very different personality, actually, because um, actors in particular, they love to perform and they love an audience. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think comic people are very, um, very much in their own head. And mm-hmm. they love it when they bump into someone and they can tell everybody what's been in their head, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's a very different personality type, actually. Like comic guys have a long time to think things through. You know, they, they have a lot of ideas and opinions in a way that I, I I think it's a little bit different. Somebody who's who 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 loves to be seen and, and be in front of a camera is very different from the guy who wants not to be seen, yeah. you know, and spends 99% of their time alone. Mm. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, it's, it's a very different world. I really like both. I, I really like both personality types. Yeah. But the people in production, I mean, should be very interesting. Production is the, is the part I... I interest me the most in, in yeah. movies 
because it's, it's the, the the part I can relate to. I mean, yeah. the imagine the new world, the one, the way you want to, you know, to tell the story or everything. I can relate to that. I do. I love it, but it's funny. I, I a lot of people would be surprised to hear this from me, especially as someone who sold this company to a Hollywood studio. But mm -hmm. I never saw the ultimate aspiration to to do something outside of comics. For me, comics was the thing I wanted to get into, yeah. and Hollywood is an amazing thing you know it's the amazing thing in my life it changed my life completely obviously you know selling the company to, to netflix but um but there's a purity to comics you know the idea that you and i can sit together and mm. up the big game and i'm typing on a little keyboard and you're using a pencil or, or you're using your computer your laptop um mm. and we don't need anyone else we just do it it's just the two of us and we can create this thing it's so dangerous we don't need a big budget we don't, you know, we don't need 300 people on the set or legal approval or anything. We just do it. That's what I love about comics because they are cheap. Yeah. Uh, they, are, they are the cheapest visual media that you yeah. can get. I mean, the cheapest, the, the most dangerous media there is, is books because yeah. they are almost free. I mean, you can put everything in a book because you have, you don't have to, <laughs> you, you don't need the approval for that. And comics, they are the next step. I mean, it's visual. You have all the resources of the of the visual arts, like photography or movies or whatever. And with that kind of control, with a relative small budget. I mean, it's super small budget compared with a movie. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's what you say. It's like two people or one one guy in a room with no need to approval for anyone. It's like telling a story. That's what I love about comics. They, they, you know, people told me like, don't, don't you want to work in animation or anything? It's like, it takes too long. I mean, it takes too long, and it takes a lot of people to, to give the opinion of what you are doing. And for me, I, I guess I'm a spoiler with comics. You know, I'm compromised. I mean, you in a comic, you don't think about budget, but also at the same time, it's you don't have to think about the creative decisions other people are making. It's 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 almost autonomous, isn't it? It's, it's too obvious. Mm -hmm. Novels is the only thing that is even more autonomous. But I think um, I've had such a new appreciation, I think, of it, but I, I realise I'm watching San Diego and that San Diego's this coming weekend. And I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been tweeting about this, that people are freaking out that it's just the comic guys who are going to San Diego, that the actors, mm -hmm. the directors and everything are going. And I'm like, guys... You know, in a kind of creative lull in the late 1990s, I, I went to San Diego when comics wasn't super popular. The Image guys had kind of come and gone and Marvel mm. and DC weren't doing a huge number of successful books. And it was the most exciting thing I'd ever been to in my life. There was a hundred plus thousand people there over the few days. It was huge, even before the movie guys came, you know. And I do feel as if in some ways the studios were a bit like the bullies in school, the jocks in school coming and taking comic guys' lunch money. I feel mm. they came and took San Diego and mm. everybody stood back and was like, oh, well done, you famous actors, you know, and letting everybody on stage and everything and giving up their X-Men panel and giving up their Batman panels and everything. And I do, I see this San Diego as an opportunity for the comic guys to reassert themselves and think, no, mm -hmm. we, we are, you know, we are the dog, you know, you guys are the yeah. tail. And, and I, I think we need to remember how cool comics is. Yeah, but I mean, in in terms of money, I mean, you know, that kind of events, they're always leaning about the thing that brings the bigger crew and, you know, the bigger crowd and, and, and more money and all that. I mean, we we have one panel in, in Big Game that I think of kind of illustrates this this thing, you know, the the panel of Kikas in the comic book shop. Yeah. Yeah, that panel was, was great to do because I, I could see your opinion on the industry right now the opinion of the business right now and the opinion of the uh, we're going towards the wrong point it's like yeah. the merchandising and all, all that kind of stuff and we're missing the comics we're missing the the stories we're missing what make this big. i think if, you know the scene you're talking about it's not too much of a spoiler but it's kick ass is in his comic book store for the first time in a while mm. you know because dave lazuski is a comic book fan that's why i became kick ass and he's looking around and it's basically Figures, action figures, bobbleheads, all these kind of things, Funkos, and Japanese comic books, you know, that are imported into into the states, and it's not it's not the comic books he he grew up on, and I I think I mean on the one hand I'm the biggest manga fan out there I've I've been reading it since 1988 you know I've, I I read everything, but like um but at the same time I also as much as I'm pleased that people are discovering these books and they're selling so well. 
I'm somebody who works in the Western comic book industry, so I don't think we should give up. You know, I think that American yeah. and European comic book guys need to also try their hardest and dominate those shelves again because people are horrified when they hear the numbers. I see the black and white numbers. 79% of the American market last year was Japanese manga books, you know? Yeah, the manga is kicking really hard. Here in Spain, it's the same. Image, image, and same in France as well, you know? Image, boom, you know, Dark Horse, everybody, all added together, all the indies are only 2% of the American market. The entire American indie scene is only 2% of the market. And Marvel and DC together is only 6%. So, I mean, it's staggering. And, and on the one hand, I love it because... I love the books and my kids love the books. My kids absolutely adore them. But at the same time, I really want comic guys to be like, let's not give up the shelves, you know, and let's not get not, not give up this the the San Diego space, you know, on the stages to movie guys. You know, we 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 need to reassert the American and British comic book scene I, again, I think, and really try our best. It's it's a war fight. I mean, I think we are opening the the big um subject. <laughs> when when I have to now I have to run, but I I think we are opening right now the big subject is like yeah that we're uh, I don't know there is a lot of stuff to to talk about that why is that why why they are losing the audiences why the kids they are more interested in manga that they never knew about that in the in the Avengers or the Justice League uh you know the the this I, it, it hit me with the Indiana Jones movie the last one. Like they are, we're, you know, recycling, you know, the references again and again and again, it's the same references once and and I think that the kids they need new things that they are not belong to their father. I mean, the Hulk is the hero my father liked. I I need a hero for myself, and it cannot be the same one. So this kind of, I think we need to create new reference and uh, new icons. I think you you did it really well with Mirror World because. All your characters, they are icons yeah. and they are new. And and that's why I think you, you had the, the 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 big success you have because you, you managed to create icons. I mean, when I was doing when I was drawing Kikas, I felt more or less the same when I was doing Spider-Man. It's like I I draw myself, but it's not it doesn't belong to me. It's like it's so iconic. Yeah. You know, that it looks like printed. It's not yeah. like drawn by me, it's like it looks like printed because it's an icon. Yeah. So I think I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm talking too much without knowing. I, I'm I don't know, but I think we need to create new characters, references that the the, the kids can relate to and say, okay, this is mine. This is something. This is something I I can relate to. You know. Yeah. yeah. And it's, but I think I hate to sound like Tony Robbins, right? You know, but I also think if the American industry doesn't value themselves. You know, mm -hmm. if you give up San Diego to the, the movie guys, if you give up the bookstores to the manga books, if you don't value what you do, the readers won't value you either. You know, we have to get our self-confidence back as an industry, I think, and actually mm -hmm. feel what you're doing is something that's mass market and for everyone again, you know, like, I, I, I think comic guys have sort of lost their mojo a little bit sometimes when I talk to people. Uh, a few of my friends are looking, how do I get out of the industry and so on? Uh, and I, I feel stronger than ever. I want we're, to, you know. we're going to reconquer those spaces with this one. <laughs> <laughs> we can't do that well, listen what can I say except thanks so much for not, um, just this, not just doing it twice because we buggered it up or I buggered it up last night but I got the, myself um, three hours of Mar Miller for myself only I mean who can't say that <laughs> I mean, thanks thank, for doing such a job you. I mean the job thanks. is sensational I could not be happier with this book I'm so proud of it and I think it'll be an evergreen I think it'll be one of those collections that people read for a long time, you know, and just artists are going to have this on their shelf. So thank you for, for all that. I hope so. I mean, I, I had a great time doing it. It was a very special year in, in my life because all the thing that happened, you know, and it, and it was fantastic to you. Something that happened with, with, with uh, my little kid was born. It was that drawing became my hobby again. Yeah. Because the kid became my work. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was like there was so much things to do with with the baby. So when I got to get into my studio and and to work, yeah. it was fantastic because uh, I feel like rewarded. Like uh, like okay, you earned this this moment for you. So I get to work in the book. It was it was great because I felt something I I didn't felt since you know when I was a kid and and finished the homework and then I started with. 
I'm not saying that my baby is the homework, but then, you know, <laughs> you know this this kind of feeling like, uh, okay, this is my moment, and, and I'm gonna enjoy it, and I enjoyed it a lot working in the book, and I and I think it, you can feel it in the pages. Well, the, to be continued, let's work on something again at some point once our schedules are are clear. sure. Total pleasure and great talking to you as well. You know, so yeah. I'll catch it's, been, you it's been great doing it twice, man. It was, it was. I mean, it was a, it was a gift. I have three hours of you. So it was <laughs> Thank you. All the best and good night, then, Pip. Hey, have a nice weekend. Hey guys, Mark here. Just in case we didn't plug it enough, big game issue one out now from me and Peppy. Also on sale, Nemesis Reloaded trade paperback collecting the whole series and the big finale this month as well for Nightclub. Nightclub issue six, double sized issue. I hope you enjoy it, and I'll catch you soon.